<laughs> we didn't meet last Wednesday, and there were things that I wanted to bring out from lesson two. I didn't want to just let that one go by. So we're going to try and do lesson two and three tonight. We'll see how that goes. <clears throat> lesson two and lesson three. These are the ones you just brought? Okay. I'm glad that you're here tonight. And for those of you who are tuning in from home, I'm glad that you're here also. Lesson two has to do with can we know God and how God reveals himself to man. So we have some handouts being passed out. In every civilization and every culture, no matter how sophisticated or simple, we find some understanding of God or gods. Anthropologists will tell us that every culture is in awe of the powers of nature. And so they come up with ideas that personify these forces. And then from these beginnings, cultures develop methods of behavior, and other rituals that are intended to appease those forces that are destructive or to express appreciation and adoration for those forces necessary to sustain life. And so religions are born and gods are created. In Acts 17, Paul is walking around Athens. He's in the marketplace, the Agora, a place where the Athenians would come to hear the news and to share the new things that they have heard. And Paul is struck by the number of altars that are in that city. There were a lot. And he goes on when he's asked by the Greeks to talk about this Jesus that he's been preaching in the synagogue and perhaps in other places. Um, tell us more about this. Paul starts talking about the, the altar that he had seen to the unknown God, one that they had just in case they had overlooked one or more and didn't want to offend them. How many gods did the Greeks have? They had a bunch. <clears throat> one website that I looked at said that the Greeks had 61 gods. I don't know if that's accurate. I didn't do a lot of research, but I figured 61, that's, that's a lot. That'd keep you busy trying to keep them all happy. The Romans had 82. In Canaan, 23 gods, and the Assyrians had 17 major gods, and they didn't even try to count the minor gods. They just said there's many others. So you can see, and, and we know from mythology and things that we know from past cultures, they had lots of gods. And what were these gods like? They were very much like human beings because man created these and attributed to them the characteristics that they, they know about. The gods that, that I'm aware of from Greek mythology, which is the mythology that I'm probably most familiar with, they lusted, coveted, stole, killed, they had their favorite humans on earth. They had their favorites among the, the Pantheon crowd, but it was all competition. You know, who's, who's the better, who's the, the more loved, whatever. Pretty much human behavior is what you would find in the behavior of the Greek gods and the Roman gods too. And no doubt others from other civilizations as well. How does that differ from the God of the Bible? Well, God has made himself known. <clears throat> he has made himself known to us. He sustains his creation. 
and he loves his creation. Even as far back as the Garden of Eden, we find God walking in the cool of the day, engaging in conversation with Adam and Eve, enjoying his creation with his creator. We know that he spoke to the patriarchs in their time, giving him them his commands, helping them to understand how God was to be worshiped. On Mount Sinai, the, the law was handed down to Moses, who in turn gave it to the Jews, who promised that they would faithfully follow this law. And they tried. In all things, God has warned of the dangers, things that we are to avoid. <clears throat> He's pointed out the safe path that we should take. Despite man's sin, he has given us his only begotten son who came to earth, took on the form of man, suffered the death on the cross, all to satisfy God's righteousness and justice. God is righteous and demands that we be righteous also. <clears throat> The God of the Bible has more things to say. Not only does he talk about what he is, but he also talks about other gods. And the passage in Isaiah 41, I think, is an interesting one. God there through the prophet Isaiah says, present your case, bring forth your strong reasons. Let them, speaking of these false gods, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. Or declare to us things to come. In my first class, Bill, you, you mentioned prophecy as the greatest testimony to the truth that the Bible presents. No other religion has prophecy in the way that the Christian religion does, the Jewish religion does. <clears throat> He goes on to say, show the things that are come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. And then he concludes, indeed, you are nothing. Your work is nothing, these false gods. He who chooses you is an abomination. These are God's words about the gods that man has created. I think it's clearly stated. And our God is not like these other gods. He goes on in other passages. In Jeremiah, he's talking about the process that a man would go through to create an idol to represent the God that he's worshiping. And here he's describing going into the forest, cutting down a tree, working with an ax, then decorating this creation, whatever it is, animal, man, tree stump, Decorate it, fasten it, make it stand upright so it won't fall. Look at verse 5. They are upright like a palm tree. These false gods cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. And then God says, don't be afraid of them. For they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. Isaiah 44, verses 9 through 20. This is a longer passage. You may want to just make note of this and read through this, but it, it's the similar description that we just saw in Jeremiah, talking about a man uh, creating a false god, just goes into more detail about it, and even describes the foolishness of bringing a tree trunk in, taking part of it to build a fire, to bake your bread, part of it to warm your house so that you're comfortable in the cold weather, and the remainder you fashion into a God, bow down to it, and ask it to deliver you. You've had full control over everything except the final product, which is something of your own imagination. It's ridiculous. It's foolishness. And God does not want us to do that. <clears throat> Unlike the gods that man has created, our God, the God we read about in the Bible, loves us 
and he demonstrates that love. I've already mentioned the gift of his son Jesus for us. No greater demonstration of love can be imagined for him to give his son for us. And we read in scripture that God had this plan to redeem man from before the foundation of the world. Before creation, God already had the plan. Ephesians 1 talks about this. 1 Peter 1 verse 20 also mentions this. He gave prophecies, declarations of what was to come, starting in the Garden of Eden, about the woman crushing, the seed of woman crushing the head of the serpent, Satan. The first prophecy of Jesus coming, Abraham, Moses, the prophets all spoke of this Messiah that was to come. And then we find Jesus, when the time was right, coming into the world. And in these last days, he's the one that is speaking to us rather than the prophet speaking to the fathers. And we enjoy God's full revelation. We, we can see his full plan of salvation laid out for us in scripture so that we know how we should serve God so that we can benefit from his mercy and forgiveness and salvation. Consider Jesus who left heaven came to earth to live here as a man. That had to be a tremendous step down to be in heaven with God and to come and live like a man. And not a great man, but a poor man. Just a common, born into the family of a carpenter. During his ministry, we find passages that Jesus looked on the multitudes that were coming to him and he was moved with compassion. He had a love for mankind. In John 11, his friend Lazarus has died and Martha and Mary have sent for him to come and heal him. And Jesus delays intentionally. And when he gets there, <coughs> Lazarus has been dead for several days. Knowing that he was going to raise Lazarus back to life, Jesus stood before the tomb and wept. Why? He knew what was going to happen. The joyous occasion of bringing Lazarus back to life, I think he was moved by the tears of Martha and Mary, whom he also loved. And for the state of man that has to go through death. But Jesus wept. In Hebrews 4, the writer describes Jesus as being our high priest. The Hebrew letter also describes him as our mediator who goes between us and God, who is pleading our case. But in the chapter four, we read there that he's our high priest and he sympathizes with our weakness. Even when we fail him, he still cares for us. What a blessing that is. I also want to talk for a moment about Hebrews 12 too. <clears throat> for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. Joy and cross just don't seem to come together in, in my mind. Crucifixion is a very terrible way to die, and yet Jesus saw joy there. I'm sure it wasn't the cross that was the joy, because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's asking God, take this from me. I don't want to go through this, but I will do what you need me to do. I will be obedient to you. And I think he was looking beyond the cross to the salvation that would come to mankind that would be obedient to him. That's the joy that was set before him, knowing that he was going to open heaven's doors to mankind. That's the joy. And so he endured the cross. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit now and talk about natural versus special revelation. How do we know a person? What does a person do that causes us to know them?
what they say and do. What they say and what they do. That, that pretty well sums it up. And yet even when people say things, they can still deceive us or keep things hidden. Even watching what people do, there can be some surprises. Occasionally you'll, you'll read the newspaper that someone has passed away and left a tremendous fortune behind that no one ever knew they were wealthy. They had friends, family that, that were close to them, but had no idea that they had this wealth. On the flip side, someone can commit some terrible crime and neighbors and friends and family will say, he always seemed like such a normal guy. I never would have guessed he would do this or she would do this. So even seeing what people do and hearing what they say, we can be deceived. But God does provide both types of revelation. He has done things, which we will look at in the next lesson, lesson three. <clears throat> he has designed our planet, our solar system, our universe. And we look at the complexity and the interdependence of all of that, and we can see a good God. He has given us everything that we need. And it's, it's evident. Romans 1 says, man is without excuse if you look at nature and can't figure out that there's a God who made this. So we see natural revelation. Psalm 19 is the passage that I have on the slide where those opening verses, um, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Just look around you. And if you can't see God in that, you need your eyes checked. The latter part of that um, same psalm, Psalm 19, talks about the giving of God's law. And we sing the song, the, the law of the Lord. His statutes are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The judgments are true and righteous altogether. All More to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. God has spoken to us. And man has written these words. And God's actions has pre have preserved these written words through the ages so that we can read and understand and know what we ought to do. God has shown us by design, by the things that he has done, he has shown us by the things that he has said. And as I mentioned, Hebrews 1.1, in times past, he spoke to us by the prophets. Now he speaks to us through his dear son. <clears throat> God has gone to great extremes to make his will known to mankind. He has given his only begotten son as a sacrifice for our sins. But the one thing he hasn't done is twist our arm to be compliant. He leaves that up to our free choice. He makes the information available, and then it's our choice. In Revelation 3, the Apostle John writes there and describes Jesus as standing at the door and knocking and asking to come in. What are we going to do? We're going to ignore him? We wouldn't do that to a friend who came to the door. We would open the door and invite them in. What will we do with Jesus? I think I know what we have already done. We have invited him into our lives. And that is most of what I wanted to cover from lesson two. So now we'll transition into lesson three and this gets into divine design. <clears throat> We're going to focus on the te teleological argument for the existence of God. This name comes from the Greek word teleos, which means design. And it's a simple syllogism. The first statement is every design has a designer. Look at anything around you. Someone has designed it. Someone has created it. That's true for the things that man has created. It's true for the creation that's here that man makes use of and the things that he creates. Every design has a designer. And as we look at the universe around us, we can see the intricate 
interdependency of so many things that have to be just right in order for everything to work as it does. So every design has a designer. The universe has a complex design. Therefore, the universe had a designer. It's a simple, logical sequence. Sir Isaac Newton implicitly <coughs> confirmed the validity of this argument when he marveled at the design of the solar system. He, he wrote this, this is the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets, and it can only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. He was impressed by what he saw as he explored and, and gained more knowledge about the laws of physics that he revealed for mankind. <clears throat> To understand how divinely designed our world is, I want to consider some interdependent environmental conditions which are called anthropic constants. And collectively, these constants comprise the anthropic principle. This sounds complicated, but it's really just things in our environment, things in our world, things in the solar system, the universe, that have to be just right in order for life to exist. You know that we are designed and are able to live basically in all conditions on this planet. We've even gone outside this planet where there aren't the resources needed to keep us alive, but we've been able to carry with those who have ventured out into space the things that they need to preserve their life and come back home safely. But all these things are very finely set. And if we look at some of these, we're gonna see just how big a difference a small change could make. And we're gonna use some details from the Apollo 13 mission to try and illustrate this. If you, I think many of you were here in 1970, some of you were not. But if you weren't, you may have seen the Apollo 13 movie. So you know all about this planned trip to the moon. It's April 13th, 1970. Commander Jim Lovell and two other astronauts are on Apollo 13. They are flying at 2,000 miles per hour headed for the moon. And Commander Lovell hears a bang. It's not the blast off. They're already out in space. He hears a bang and he thinks it's Swigert playing a practical joke. He looks at Swigert. Swigert's got the big eyes too, like this is not good. <clears throat> they look at some of the uh, sensors and uh, controls of their command module and they see that the oxygen tank sensors are showing 20%, over 100%. They're just swinging wildly and they can't figure out what's going on. Two of the three fuel cells are dead. The third one is depleting rapidly. Oxygen in tank two is now reading zero. And as he looks out the window of the command module, he sees what looks like gas venting. He can't really see where it's coming from, but there's not supposed to be anything like that happening. They were later able to confirm that the venting gas was oxygen, which is critical to their survival. In fact, the number two oxygen tank had exploded, damaging tank one in the process. And that brings up our first anthropic principle, and that is oxygen. <clears throat> Earth's atmosphere is 21% oxygen. If it were a higher percentage, fires would automatically, spontaneously occur. If we had too little oxygen, we would die for lack of oxygen. It's a fine balance in our atmosphere that's, that's maintained by other factors like photosynthesis. <clears throat> the lack of oxygen 
on board the ship is not the only problem though, because the oxygen is used to create water and electricity for their craft. So with the lack of oxygen, they are now going to be short on water. They're gonna be short on power. And these are not things you can just step outside your spacecraft and get. They are headed in the wrong direction and there's no way to reverse course. Fortunately, they have the uh, the lunar excursion module. And if you look at this um, on the right side, you see the service module and then sort of a conical shape. That's the command module. And then the bug look like looking thing on the left end is the lunar module. <clears throat> the lunar module is the portion that would actually descend to the, the moon surface with two astronauts while a third one stayed in the command module. It's designed for about 40 hours of operation supporting two men. But we've got three men that need to move into that and survive for four, 48 hours, four, I'm sorry, four days, four days, <clears throat> 96 hours. So a lot longer time, more people, limited resources, they are in trouble. <clears throat> to conserve water, oxygen and electricity, they shut down all the non-essential systems and decrease their water consumption to just a small cup a day. One of the astronauts is becoming ill. They are all suffering the effects of dehydration, which affects their ability to focus. And with all the computing systems shut down, they are needing to be able to stay focused even more than ever. They're going to have to <clears throat> continue on to the moon, orbit around the moon, firing their rockets at just the right time to break that and then return back to the earth. And they're gonna to have to do these based on manual calculations and manual navigation by using the stars. As they are coming back toward earth, they have to be on just the right trajectory. And that's because of the atmosphere. The atmosphere has a density that will affect their command module as it tries to re-enter. If they come in at too shallow an angle and hit the atmosphere, they will skip off just like skipping stones across the surface of the water. If they come in at too steep of an angle, they will become unstable. The command module will probably flip all around. The heat shield is not protecting them. The craft will be destroyed. So they have to come in at just the right angle. And that difference, five and a half degrees below the horizon line is the minimum. The maximum is seven degrees. So they've got a, a degree and a half difference in that window to try and hit based on their manual calculations. <clears throat> the anthropic constant too, the atmospheric transparency and density is another one of these constants. If it were less transparent, too little sunlight would reach the surface. We would freeze to death. If it were more transparent, we would burn up too much solar radiation. <clears throat> Calculating their rocket burn coming off from the moon was also a critical factor for them and is a, a third anthropic yeah. constant. The gravitational pull between the earth and the moon is balanced just right. If the moon were larger or closer, or if the earth were a different size, things could be very different here on earth. Right now, it's perfectly in balance. If the gravitational attraction were greater, the tides would be much greater. It would affect the rotation of the earth. It would affect the <laughs> atmosphere. All of these would be affected. If the gravitational forces between earth and the moon were less, it would cause other kinds of instabilities. In fact, the moon may not even stay here. It may just fly off. 
to some other place. <clears throat> Life would be impossible. Anthropic constant number three. As they are making their maneuvers coming back toward Earth, they encounter another problem, and that is too much carbon dioxide in their atmosphere in the lunar excursion module. Mission control says there's spare filters in the command module. Get those and plug them in, you'll be good. Well, the command module and the lunar module were built by different companies. The, the command module uses rectangular filters to scrub the carbon dioxide. The lunar module uses round ones. They don't fit. So ground control, assembled things that they knew that was on board the ship. And they come up with a plan of what they can do to, to make these round, I'm sorry, these square filters fit the round openings. And it involved space, space suit hoses, cardboard, plastic waste bags, and duct tape. Yay, duct tape. <clears throat> they were able to assemble this on the ground then tell them how to do it, and they did it, and it worked. So now they've got the atmosphere within the, the craft coming back down to the, the right levels, which brings up the next anthropic constant, carbon dioxide level. CO2, oxygen, nitrogen, those are the major gases in our atmosphere, and they are in exactly the right balance where they need to be for, our, for life as we know it here. If CO2 were higher, you hear this a lot when talking about climate change, runaway greenhouse effect. And so they're trying to curb our CO2 uh, emissions. If the CO2 level were lower, plants would not maintain efficient photosynthesis, which contributes to the right balance and mix of gases, we would die. That's number four. As they approach the Earth, it's time to go back into the command module, jettison the lunar module and service module, and then prepare for re-entry. The command module has been basically shut down, and it has gotten cold in there. It's 38 degrees. Fuel cells are not working. All they have is batteries. And so again, mission control comes up with a sequence that they think will work to restart all the systems that are needed to get the command module back to the ground. And they relay these instructions and the crew carries that out. Because of the cold in the command module, water in the air is condensing and dripping into the electronic circuitry which makes turning things back on a real risk. Are they gonna burn up circuit boards in the process? Well, it didn't happen. They were able to get things um, back in, in uh, operation again, and then come on into earth. I had mentioned that as they were going to the moon, they were traveling at 2000 miles an hour. But as they're approaching earth now, they're coming in at 25,000 miles per hour, seven miles a second, which brings up the fifth anthropic constant, and that is gravity. The Earth's gravitational force is powerful, but if it were altered by even that little bit that you see written there, one preceded by 37 zeros, I don't know what fraction that is, I can't tell you a name for that, but it's incredibly minute. Change our gravity by that much and our sun would not exist. And of course, without the sun, we would not exist either. <clears throat> well, we know that they came on in safely. The parachutes deployed as they should. And after four days of nail biting suspense, they safely landed. The crew survived against all odds. Human beings can only survive in a very narrow envelope of environmental condition. 
And so these spaceships that venture out into the voids of space have to be designed with exacting standards and precision. The thing that caused the problem on Apollo 13, the oxygen tank that first blew up, apparently in the process of installing it had been dropped two inches. And that was enough to weaken the, the wall of the tank and cause it to rupture after they'd been in space for a few days. So that small change affected them tremendously. And it was only through a lot of work by ground control and the level-headedness of the, the three on board that they were able to put everything back together, get things working as they should and get back home. We've looked at five anthropic constants. There are over a hundred of these, but a few more that I'll just mention. The centrifugal force of planetary movements, if it did not precisely balance, our solar system would fly apart. Nothing would be held in orbit around the sun. If the universe, which we know is expanding and getting bigger moment by moment, if the rate of expansion had been even one millionth slower than it was, it would not have expanded, but rather it would have fallen back in on itself, collapsed, and there would have been no universe. If it had exploded or expanded faster, no galaxies would have formed. With no galaxies, there's no solar system, there's no Earth, we're not here. Many of the laws of physics describe the function, the velocity of light as part of their uh, calculations. If that were any different, that could probably preclude life on Earth. The water vapor levels in our atmosphere are precise. Jupiter, the large gas giant planet near the outer edges of our solar system. If you think Earth's gravity is strong, Jupiter's is much, much stronger. And it serves as sort of a cosmic vacuum cleaner where it's positioned in the solar system, helping to keep debris, asteroids, meteors from coming through and striking the Earth. We still have some to get through, but Jupiter certainly plays a huge role in preventing more of these. The thickness of the Earth's crust is just right. If it were greater, too much oxygen would be transferred to the crust to support life. If it were thinner, volcanic activity would make life impossible. The speed at which the Earth rotates is just right. If it were a slower rotation, our days and nights would be longer. We would get too hot, we would get too cold during the day and the night life would be impossible. The tilt of the Earth on its axis as it orbits the sun, the thing that gives us our seasons, is just right. If the Earth were more vertical or more tilted, seasons would be very different, different or non-existent, precluding life. Even the discharge of lightning in our atmosphere is an anthropic constant generating nitrogen, putting nitrogen back into the soil. And seismic activity. Did you see the video of the undersea volcanic explosion in Tonga? Huge eruption. If you haven't seen that, take a look at some of the satellite imagery. If there were more, it would put so much ash and dust into the air that life would probably not be able to exist. If there were less, the nutrients that are put out into the ocean, into the air, and ultimately into the ground would, would not be there to sustain life as we know it. <clears throat> An astrophysicist has looked at the 122 anthropic constants that we have identified so far, and there may be more that will be discovered. But he has calculated the probability for all of these to exist at a point in time so that life could occur on this earth. And he came up with a number of one chance in 10 to the 138, which again is 10 with 138 zeros strung out behind it. 
if your lottery ticket says that's your chances of winning, don't buy one. You won't win. The lottery is bad enough. Again, this is a number who's so huge, I can't even tell you what it might be. It's a huge number. And you compare that to the number of atoms in the entire universe, that's only 10 to the 70th, which tells me that it's effectively impossible for these 122 constants to all have occurred naturally at a point in time so that life could occur, apart from supernatural intervention. So look at what some other people have to say. Here's a Nobel laureate. <clears throat> Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe created out of nothing, delicately balanced to provide the, exactly the right conditions required to support life. In the absence of an absurdly improbable accident, speaking of those anthropic constants, the observations of modern science seem to suggest an underlying, one might say supernatural plan. Huh. He almost said God, didn't he? Couldn't quite get that out of him. Here's another one, Fred Hoyle. The common sense interpretation of the facts suggest a super, intelligent, uh, super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology, and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. Again, he's avoiding even saying God. He's an atheist, but he does understand and realize that something must have worked to bring all these things about just right. We go back to what the Bible has to say, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. And in Isaiah, God asked the question, to whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. And in verse 26, he answers the question, lift up your eyes on high, look to the heavens and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He's describing the stars that we see in the sky at night. He brings out, God claims that he brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. I don't know how many stars there are in the universe, but it's to the point where they don't even put names on them anymore. They are cataloged with numbers and letters. And that's how man defines individual stars. God calls them all by name. And by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Psalm 103, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. God has no limits. From our perspective, neither do the heavens as we look up into the sky. God is the unlimited limiter, the uncreated creator of all things. He's self-existing, he is infinite, and he has built this vast and beautiful universe out of nothing, and he holds it all together. The only thing in our experience that, that can even approach or give us an idea of what God is, is for us to look up and see the in infiniteness of space above us. Infinity is what describes each of God's attributes, attributes, including his power, his knowledge, his justice, his love. And perhaps that's why God uses the heavens to help us grasp the infinite height of God's love. Psalm 103.11, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. There's no plausible explanation for the anthropic principle other than to declare that there's a cosmic designer. The odds have been calculated and it's virtually impossible apart from a designer. And atheists go to extreme measures to deny the obvious. They dream up hypothetical theories, not supported by evidence, and in fact are impossible. 
leaving the realm of reason and rationality and entering into the realm of blind faith, which is exactly what they accuse us of. So who has blind faith? I don't think it's us. We have God's word and it is sure. And I think we got through two lessons in one night. So thank you. I appreciate your patience with me. I think I did all the talking, but we'll do lesson four next week. There are copies out in the lobby. So pick up one of those and we will look at lesson four next week. Thank you very much.